Welcome to the Peterson's Bow Hunting Podcast. All bow hunting, all the time. Now, here are your hosts, editor Christian Berg and associate editor Mark Demko. All right, welcome back to the Bow Hunting Podcast. We are all bow hunting all the time, and it is a celebratory uh, event here in America. We're coming up on the 4th of July weekend, so happy Independence Day to everybody. And I don't know about you, but for me, 4th of July is the time that I like to go into my basement and get my big uh, tub of trail cameras out and start getting those out into the field because the bucks are, you know, growing enough antler at this point to start getting excited about what you might, and I repeat, might have a chance at uh, come this fall. And so we're going to talk some trail camera uh, strategies, tactics, deer patterning today. And I've got uh, Associate Editor Mark Demko, my co-host. Mark, welcome. Uh, Good to see you. Good morning. Nice to see you. And we have Field Editor Bill Winky, who uh, is a a long, long time contributor to Peterson's bow hunting and certainly one of the most knowledgeable people I know when it comes to whitetail hunting. So, Bill, thanks for making some time for us today. Yeah, my pleasure. You know, I just got thinking about that. And uh, I think I started writing for the magazine in 1991. So that's 30. Is that 31 years or is my math bad? Uh, I'm going to take your word for it. All I know when you said 1991 is what popped into my head. That that was the year that was the year I graduated high school. (laughs) So so you you started writing for the magazine the year I graduated high school. And I think actually didn't. Isn't that pretty much when the magazine started? Right. I think you you tell me it was going before that. I don't know how many years, but um, so I think that. I started working, writing for the magazine when Greg Tinsley was the editor. I think he was the second editor. I think Bob Robb was the first editor, and then it was Tinsley. Um, So he's the one that brought me in. So it it was going for a while uh, before that. Well, that's why I think you know so much about whitetails, because you knew a lot about whitetails when I was still in high school. So you really know a lot about whitetails now. And I think um, there's, so, there's so much information now. I think back then we were guessing on a lot of stuff, you know, and if you could write, put, you know, five words together in the sentence, you had a job. Uh, but now there's so much information available that we can actually make viable conclusions about this stuff rather than guessing at it. Well, yeah, and that's kind of the genesis of the show today because you had written a column for our September issue, which I was just working on here this past week. And I thought, man, this will make a great topic for for right now, uh, because like I said, you know, I think this is the time as we head into July, a lot of people, you know, start getting the cameras out and people start getting excited you know, but I, I gave a caveat in my intro, you know, just because you get bucks on camera this time of year, uh, go back to what you were talking about in the days before trail cameras, you know, you'd be out, you know, there around your place in Iowa, maybe seeing a lot of these big deer in farmer's fields and getting excited and come to realize, you know, that that a lot of those deer that you were seeing in a given area in July and August weren't there come hunting season. And, and the trail camera has made our jobs uh, you know, a lot easier when it comes to figuring that sort of stuff out. Yeah, for sure. You know, I think it's a revolutionary uh, component of deer hunting. And, you know, it's it's controversial in some circles, but as far as I'm concerned, there's no controversy. I mean, you can use them, like even as I pointed out in that column, to whatever degree you want to. Um, you don't have to go all in and know every last little thing about what, what each deer is doing. You can use them to the level that, that creates satisfaction in the sport for you. And uh, I think that's part of what we want to talk about, of course, but also just the fact that it changed the whole playing field because now we know, you know, without having to guess, uh, at least part of what's going on. It was used to be a wild guess. You know, you'd look at a set of tracks and you think, oh, that must have been a big one. Or you see a big scrape and you'll think, oh man, that buck, that dream buck must have made that scrape. Well, it could have been a little six pointer, you know, I mean, we, we spent a lot of time spinning our wheels where uh, now we can be more focused with our time. And if nothing else, trail cameras have done that. You know, not only have we learned a lot about how deer behave in, in the real world, 
but we don't spin our wheels hunting spots where there's not a deer that we even want to shoot. Yeah, I don't know if I need to warn you, but the cops just drove behind you, so they may oh, have fig- figured out where you are, <laughs> Bill. <laughs> Let me get in my truck. Can you finish this in my truck? <laughs> well, yeah, I mean, you said one thing that so cracked me up. Like, you talked about, you know, you, whenever you're walking in the woods and somebody sees a rub on a big tree and they're, it's like, I'm like, you don't think booners rub three-inch well, trees? I mean, they do. Yeah. <laughs> and the, con- the converse is also true. Everybody thinks because it was a big rub that it had to have been a big deer. Well, that's not true either. I've seen a lot of really small bucks rubbing on big trees. And granted, they may not tear those trees up, but you can't assume that just because it's on a tree that's the size of your calf, that it was made by a, you know, 170-inch deer or something stupid like that. You know I mean? You really can't judge a lot of that stuff without seeing the deer uh and it's so hard to see them so now we got the trail cameras to do that for us yeah so to to get us back on track here so your column and this is really where i want to focus our conversation you talked about basically three levels of patterning bucks that you can do using trail cameras and I'm going to simplify it a little bit just as a teaser. You got your sort of your basic, your intermediate and your advanced. And I'll let you walk us through that, uh, Bill. But but basically it can go as far as you want to take it. And and you can sort of use your personal preferences to guide your efforts. Yeah. And I think, you know, I'll just I'm going to move through it like a sliding scale, you know, rather than diving into a bunch of details on each one of those levels. Um, and, and you more or less summarized that whole column uh, with that last couple of sentences. The, the point is, as a very minimum, I think it makes sense to use your time effectively. I don't care who you are, you know, whether you're a, a, a crazy white tail geek or just the guy that's got, you know, a, a passing interest in it. You might as well be hunting where there is a deer that you would like to shoot, you know, whatever that is, you know, whether it's a you know, a mature buck or a deer. Uh, so it doesn't make any sense to spend your time hunting places where there's not something that you would be willing to shoot. That's just common sense. So that's the, what I would call the basic level of patterning. You know, just find a deer or some deer that you would be willing to hunt. And then now you know where those deer live. So there's no point in hunting anywhere else because, you know, you, let's say you've got six days all season to hunt spend those six days in places where you know there's something that you'd be willing to shoot. Um, and, and even if you only do that, you will greatly improve not only your success rate, but I think the, the enjoyment that you have going uh, because, you know, unless you just love watching squirrels run around, which is cool too, you know, you're really there for action. You know, you'd love to see that deer or a deer or whatever it is that you're after, uh, you know, come by and, and, you know, trail cameras make that possible. A lot, a lot more possible. Yeah, I guess, Mark, Mark, that kind of flies in the face of the people in our community who are like, oh, I don't need any cameras. You know, I just go out and hunt. And, you know, to Bill's point, oh, yeah, you can do that. You can go you can literally walk into the woods and pick any tree and go up and sit there. And if you have unlimited time, then yeah, man, it might be a good way to spend your season. Maybe six weeks in, you'll figure out where there's some action. But you know, wouldn't you rather use some of the tools available to you? Yeah, I mean, absolutely. I think it, it's a great resource. And as we've stressed, you can use it as much or as little as you want. Uh, a lot of people in today's world don't have as much time to maybe get out in the field. They can sneak out a couple hours on the weekend or maybe a, a couple of days during the rut. And, and this can really help you uh, gather some good intel uh, as far as if there's a specific buck you want to target or maybe if, if, I'll give you a good example. So I have four acres at my house in woods and four acres is my yard. And uh, there was a buck I watched for two years and that buck would be totally nocturnal throughout uh, um, most of the summer and only start to show up in daylight as you moved into October and only in the evening. So that was good intel uh, for me to know. Now, it just so happened that the couple of days I hunted at my house last year, I didn't get it. Uh, he did show up in my yard on the one night I had to take my daughter to a football game. She's in the band. But, but my point there is, uh, if you have limited time, 
um, using a trail camera can be a good resource. And it, it's, it's, it's not going to tell you the whole story uh, unless you're running multiple cameras at, at every single spot. You know, if you, I, I think a lot of guys probably just run a, a handful of cameras um, and uh, I, it can be a really good tool and you can use it as much or little as you'd like. Bill, what uh, we need to put a caveat in here. You know, Mark even touched on some things like, and again, because we're, we're still in the summer here, you put some cameras out, you get some good bucks now, you know, even at this elementary level, how recent of information do you really need to rely on, you know, to, to judge hunting? Well, and that's why I put this in the September column. Um, because to me, I, I don't even start until September. Um, and, and some people just love looking at deer and they love to see the antlers grow and all that stuff. And, and I don't blame them for that. But the information that they get prior to the early September, mid-September timeframe is kind of misleading uh, because, you know, we, we've talked about it a lot and I've written about it a lot. And, and uh, we've all experienced it is the bucks have summer range and a fall range. And they'll stick with their summer range until the velvet comes off and they break up their bachelor groups. That's kind of, it's a testosterone thing. You know, the testosterone makes them grumpy. They don't want to be together anymore. So the bachelor groups separate. That's what also starts the process of, of uh, the velvet shedding is their rising testosterone levels. So that's all related to the hours of daylight, which, so it's not going to change from year to year. It's going to be the first week of September throughout almost the entire whitetail range every year. That's going to signal that transition from summer to fall. And now as they're breaking up their bachelor groups, these bucks are dispersing into different ranges. Uh, a certain percentage of them will stay in the summer range, but another percentage of them will disperse into a different range. And uh, I had a guy that worked for me for a while and he'd been a grad student in uh, whitetail studies. And he said that um, the average dispersal was about a half a mile in the studies that, that he did between summer and fall range. So, you know, if the average is a half a mile, there's going to be some that don't move. And there's going to be some that move a mile, you know, or who knows what, you know, I mean, there's going to be uh, some massive transitions during that time frame. So while it's interesting up until the first part of September, uh, it's it's also um, fairly misleading. So that's, I feel like the official trail camera season starts sometime around the first week, the 7th, 8th, 10th of September. That's why I said 4th of July is my unofficial start because <laughs> I'm one of those guys that likes to get pictures of big velvet bucks. Mm -hmm. And I, 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 it's really just entertainment. Like in July and August, it's more entertainment than real value. Because again, you don't know, you touched on something, you talked about that you know, first 10 days or so of September when things start to change, that's going to coincide, you know, biologically, like you said, that photo period, <clears throat> but what you're also, that's when the bucks are going to strip out of velvet. And so right around that time that they're going from velvet to hard antlers, that's when you're going to start to see a big shift in their patterns. And the other big thing, as you get closer to season, like here in Pennsylvania, it's usually the first Saturday in October. Sometimes it could be like September 30th, depending on how the calendar falls. But, you know, I know the opening day varies, but the other variable, you know, obviously we have to be mindful of the deer biology and the things that are going to be constant year to year. The other thing that's a big deal for us, maybe not quite as a big deal, you know, for you in Iowa, we're the, the pressure isn't as high as those couple of weeks leading up to opening day, all of a sudden there's a lot more people in the woods. Guys are out there putting up stands, trimming lanes, uh, maybe putting out cameras for the first time. And man, that really throws another variable into the mix too. So again, even if yeah. you're not going crazy, you know, with your camera patterning, um, you know, you really kind of have to be, you know, pretty recent to, to have mm -hmm. something to go on because you may have had a buck in the area up until just a, a four or five days before opening day. And then all of a sudden the neighbors get crazy with their prep and, and they blow the deer out of there. Yeah. And, and, and it goes the other way too, because um, I always feel like I don't know what's there until the middle of October because you, you know, you've got uh, bucks that are still filtering into their fall ranges clear up till then. I mean, I, I'll find deer that show up, 
October 1st, you know, and even without any hunting pressure in that whole area, they still haven't got there yet. You know, by October 1st or the, you know, first week in October, then they settle in and then they get them pretty regular after that. So, you know, I, I suppose it probably can go even deeper than that, you know, into October before you really know what you've got for sure. But I usually quit around the 15th of October with my cameras, somewhere 15th to 20th. Um, generally by then I figure, okay, I know enough. I've got a pretty good idea, you know, where some bucks are that I'd like to hunt. Then I'm going to put the cameras away. So, I mean, that's just me, you know, and, and I've kind of jumped ahead. I'm the intermediate patterning category guy. Um, you know, the, 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 or the very basic might be just find some deer to hunt, find a buck that I'm interested in, pull the cameras and call it good. I'm going to stick with it a little bit longer because I want to know a few more things about those deer. Um, and, and we can talk about that if you're ready. But uh, I, I do put my cameras away roughly about the time I start hunting or, or slightly before that, uh, generally. I mean, there's exceptions yeah. to that. Sometimes you get a daylight active buck early in October, but usually you don't. It's pretty rare. A couple things on what you just said. One, coming back to the whole hunting pressure thing, I think at least in, in our part of the world, if you have a buck by the middle of October that's still a regular on your cameras, that's telling me that that buck feels pretty safe in that general area because by the middle of October, there's going to have been enough hunting pressure that if that pressure was going to completely move a buck out of an area or change his pattern, that would probably have happened by now. So if I was getting a, a buck that I was really excited about on my cameras at that point, I would definitely be trying to hunt that buck. Um, but, but, you know, and I'll let you talk more about your intermediate, but also talk about, cause you're big on this in all of your articles, you know, nighttime activity versus daytime, which is a big key for you, Bill, because I know you've had some long seasons in the past trying to kill these bucks that you only had nighttime pictures of. Yeah. And I think that's, you know, it, it kind of goes back to the whole reason that we hunt. Um, you know, if you're only satisfied with this one deer, then, you know, I guess go ahead and suffer through it, you know, but I've had enough of those seasons where it really wasn't that enjoyable. I hunted one buck, I think it was for 50 or 60 straight days, and I never saw him. You know, I had some nighttime pictures of him. He was a really nice deer, of course. You know, I wouldn't have spent that much time on him, but I never saw that deer. And when the season was over with, um, I felt like I don't ever want to do that again. Um, no matter how big they are, I still want to enjoy this process. And so now I only hunt uh, bucks that are showing some daylight activity on the trail cameras or the ones that I can kind of, uh, say, backtrack and recreate in my mind where I think they're going to be daylight active. And then, you know, there's also some some uh, green flags. You know, we've I've written about it. We've talked about it is, you know, if you've got a cold front coming and the buck you're after is not on a daylight pattern yet, you might as well hunt him during that cold front and then get back out of there again. Because if he is going to break out of that nocturnal pattern for a day or two, it's going to be when that cold front passes. Uh, so. Really, any October cold front is, is a green light uh, on some of these bucks that maybe aren't daylight active. But otherwise, you can really frustrate your whole season uh, sticking with the deer that's only moving at night. Gosh, I mean, maybe you hunt him some, but you've got to have a plan B, especially if you don't have a lot of time, because you could spin your wheels on that one deer for the whole season, and then he never moves during the day. Or at you least he move during the day. Put it this way, he may not move during the day where you are because he's not, he's really not living on your farm and in your hunting area. He's living somewhere nearby and he fringes in there. You know? Yeah. So, yeah, yeah that, and, and, and I. And I want you to talk about your tactic for your cameras because it's something you had mentioned in the article. So let's say you do have a really nice buck, you're, you're getting pictures of him at night fairly consistent, consistently, but no pictures during the day. And you talked about what you'll actually do with your cameras in, in terms of moving to try to get a better idea of where that deer, you know, is spending more of its time and maybe moving during the day. Yeah. So keeping this back in the context of that column, you know, the, the basic patterning would just kind of stop off with you finding daylight active deer, you know, so you're just going to keep looking until you find one. Okay. Got him. You know, the intermediate it might be uh, what I do more of, and that's find a buck that I would like to shoot and then try to backtrack him with the cameras to find where his core area is, you know, to move closer to where that deer is living, because that's where you're going to get the daylight active photos 
of that deer. And that's where you're going to catch the buck on his feet during the day. So, you know, there's a little trick to that. And, and some of it's just luck, but, you know, the first photo that you get of that buck in the evening, he probably or may be coming from his home, his, his, you know, core area where he spends a lot of his time because he's walking from that direction, hits your camera, you know, his back end is pointing in the direction of his core in theory. You know, he can zigzag his way there and you can get misled pretty badly, but you got to start somewhere. So then I would move a camera in that direction a few hundred yards and uh, see if I can catch him or maybe two or three cameras, depending upon, you know, what your state allows as far as baiting versus non-baiting on cameras. You've got to have a different philosophy on, on, you know, how you get the pictures of this deer if you can use a pile of corn or if you can't. Um, so anyway, I would try to backtrack him and, and try to get him closer to daylight. And, you know, if you're on your property still, you might as well keep going, you know, until you get some daylight pictures of him, you know, keep backtracking. Um, so that's kind of the, I would say that's the, the, maybe the strongest point for the intermediate style of patterning is, okay, we're not going to accept the fact that this buck is just nocturnal. We're going to see if we can find where he's daylight active. We're not just going to assume that he's not daylight active anywhere. We're just going to say he's not daylight active on this camera. Let's move back where he's coming from and see if we can find him someplace else. So uh, I think that's a, that's a key. It's hard to do. It's really hard to do if you can't pour a bag of corn in front of the camera um, because now you've got to work off scrapes probably. You know, box scrapes are fine. Uh, maybe trail crossings, you know, on the edges of fields or something, you know, because you can't go diving in on top of the spots where you think the deer is bedding because, you know, maybe you find where he used to live <laughs> because he doesn't live there anymore. You know, you ran him out. So you've got to be really delicate in your approach when you start backtracking him like that. You, you can't go in there with the hammer and just pound away. Um, you got to pick away at it, you know, on the fringes. And, and uh, so it takes some patience, but that's more of, I would say, the art of trail camera patterning, patterning, uh, you don't have to go that deep. You know, the basics are fine. Just run a bunch of cameras, find a daylight active deer that you're excited about, go hunting. Um, that's, that's a great way to bow hunt. But if you want to take it one step further, you can take some of these nocturnal bucks that you think this is one I'd really love to shoot and try to find where he is daylight active. But just stay yeah. off the <laughs> Mark, I want to give you a chance to jump in because I'm sure you're having some thoughts and some questions that are popping into your mind. And before we, I have a question for Bill, but I, again, I wanted to give you a chance before we move into the advanced uh, scouting. Uh, what, uh, you know, what's in your frontal cortex? You know, it's it, it, it fascinating. And, and Bill, you touched on this a bit about <laughs> a certain point of the year. Here you pull the camera up, you have the intel you're looking for and 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 things like that. And um, do you have a specific example of a story where you did where you had to move the camera and try and figure out where that deer was coming from? And how did that how does that story end up? I was fascinated on that. We talked about like you're getting that deer, say, 10, 11 o'clock at night, two in the morning. But you really wanted to try and get that deer. Can you walk us through how that story worked out for you? Yeah. And I've got a few like that. Um Sometimes you just do it by accident. You know, you just run enough cameras and you eventually, you know, stumble on the spot. But I've had a few where I, where I specifically worked backwards like that. Uh, one of them, the deer was showing up around 10 o'clock. And in the state of Iowa, you can pour a bag of corn in front of your camera. You can't hunt over bait. So there's kind of a delicate balance there that you have to work out. And the best thing, of course, is just to talk to the local game warden and find out, you know, what, what his threshold is on that. And that's why I always did. But anyway, that aside, um, you know, he, he was coming at about 10 o'clock and he was always coming from the same direction. So I thought, well, he's coming from that block of woods over there or this next draw. So rather than going into that draw, I thought I'm going to jump around to the other side of it and see if I'm getting him over there, too. Because once again, I'm pouring out a bag of corn. So it's super easy. You know, if he's milling around over there, I'm eventually going to get him, you know, on that camera. And I started getting him closer to daylight. Now he was coming from the other direction. So I thought, okay, he's got this loop that he's making and he's betting, you know, in this little valley right down in here. So I pinpointed that deer and that was in uh, early October, like maybe around the 10th. By the time I figured out where he was living, I was getting nah, not quite daylight. You know, I'd say, you know, like 15 minutes after, you know, legal shooting time and like 
20 minutes before in the morning, you know, stuff like that, you know, so I knew it was, I was in the game. Well, I was trying to figure out how I was going to hunt this deer. And I was really muzzleloader season came in that next weekend. And well, one of my neighbors hunting right across the fence in that area got him. Uh, it was a cold front went through and I should have anticipated that and been down there because when I pulled my cameras, he was all over that and, and you know, bright daylight. So, you know, that one got away, but I did use that process and probably moved more than a quarter of a mile uh, from where I first started getting pictures of him to where I had more or less uh, isolated his daylight movement area. Um, I didn't get that one killed, unfortunately, but the neighbor got him and I guess I can't complain, you know, too much, but uh, I'd like to have shot him. Uh, <laughs> the, uh, the other one was the 2020 season, a uh, more recent one. And this deer, <clears throat> I was getting him right after legal shooting time in this valley. And uh, he was always coming from the same direction. And I know in that type of terrain, you know, where there's a lot of ridges and, and uh, bluffs that he was probably bedding up on one of those uh, nearby ridges in that direction from which he was coming. So I started hunting him up there. I think after four or five days, I killed him up on that ridge. So I didn't actually get pictures of him up there, but the direction he was coming from in the evening told me where he was probably bedding. And that's where I started hunting him and just you know carefully going in there and I ended up killing that deer. Uh, so that's, those are two examples. I might be able to, if I rack my brain, find some more, but um, they're, they're the two that jump out at me right away. Bill, before we get into the advanced um, methodology, I also wanted to just give you an opportunity to share. I'm sure people are curious as you're talking about, you know, running these cameras and, and the pictures that you're getting. Um, particular tips that you have about how you like to select the locations where you place your cameras and how you physically like to set your cameras up in the field. And also, if you have any particular uh, features or, or brand loyalty or, or anything in terms of product specific stuff that you really think is helpful to you in being more effective. The, uh, I'll answer the first part of that first. I like to uh, stay away from where I think deer my bed. Um, so, you know, in, any place where you've got some natural human activity that's non-threatening to the deer is kind of a starting point because you can use those those areas like let's say it's farm country there's lanes that the farmer uses when he comes and goes i mean you can you can go through there in your truck you can set a camera you know at various points maybe along that route or nearby that route where you don't even hardly have to walk around you know you just drive right up there set it jump in your truck or jump on your four-wheeler or whatever i mean it's ideal if you match you know, normal human activity in that area, uh, those deer don't pay much attention to that. So the, the last thing I want to do is go deep into the places where the deer are spending their time during the day. So I want to fringe those because I don't want to, you know, like we talked about, I don't want to move the deer out of the spot just in order to figure out where he was living, you know, because that, that's not going to work. Um, so I'm more, I'm, I'm gathering information, I think, in a very uh, low impact kind of way. And if I do have to do any amount of walking at all, I wear waders and, uh, and go back and forth that way because I'm not, I'm not leaving scent in the grass or, you know, any weeds or anything like that. Um, ideally, you don't give them anything human related. You know, you, you handle your cameras with gloves on, you know, clean gloves. Um, you just don't leave a lot of human scent around. And that way, the deer don't have to get used to it. You know, it's... People say, well, it takes me a long time before the deer get comfortable with my cameras. It's probably because there's too much human scent in the area. Um, so you need to scale that back. And wearing waders is a really, really good way to do that. And uh, I do that all the time. I mean, that's my my go-to method if I have to get off the, the four-wheeler or the truck hardly at all. Even if I'm walking 15 feet, I'm probably still wearing waders. Um, so, yeah, I I don't know, as an, just as an aside, Mark, I don't know if you ever were with us when Bill wrote about it, but he was the originator of the, um, the hunter's body condom. And 
he was going to actually come out with that as a product, but he said that he sweat too much and it was miserable. But do you remember that, Bill? You wrote about that, didn't you? Like basically yeah. sealing, hermetically sealing yourself inside of like a I, garbage bag or something. I don't think I called it that, though. I think <laughs> <laughs> That's cat, and nobody would forget it. That's good marketing, Bill. The Hunter's yeah, body I condom. Don't. I mean, come on. I I, I've lost interest in talking about it all. <laughs> now, if you if you go to extremes, and in, in, uh, you know, I was using PVC waders because PVC doesn't really have much of an odor, and then I'd use PVC rain jacket, and I'd duct tape the two together, and then I'd duct tape the sleeves closed. You know, the sleeve openings. And then you'd put the hood up and pull the string tight and then duct tape underneath your chin. And, and you could seal it up. And uh, you can literally hunt like that. It's very miserable. I mean, I got a fly on my face here. But you can you can literally hunt like that. And the deer uh, don't know that you're there. You know, people talk about fooling most of the deer most of the time, all the deer all the time, whatever. That's the only thing I've ever done where I felt like I could fool all the deer all the time. But it was super miserable to hunt like that. Uh, even I did a whole season. So I know that you can get away with it. And I'd drop floaters and they'd blow right to the deer, you know, 40 yards away. It's like smack right into the deer, you know. So, well, there's no better testimonial than having the floater hit the deer. Um, so that that's kind of the concept. So there are ways to keep all of your scent inside, um, but it's not a very comfortable way to hunt. And, and I would do it if I had to, you know, going to an extreme here or there, you know. I mean, sometimes it's worth it. Um, but it's not worth it every day. That was pretty miserable. So there. I'm Those sorry. I, 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 I got the money anymore. <laughs> well, better, here's a better name for it. The Hunter's Crock-Pot. Oh. Hunter's Crock-Pot, stew in your own juices and cook oh. your buck. There you go. There you go. Where were you when I had this idea originally? See, you wouldn't yeah. be doing this podcast right now because you oh. would have made like $5 million. And you'd be somewhere. Would you? Would you actually retire on the beach if you had unlimited funds or would you stay like in, in the best whitetail state in the country and just hunt deer? Well, there's, you'd, you'd be in the summertime, you'd be trout fishing in the mountains and then in the fall, you'd be whitetail hunting. And that'd be, that'd be your life. Gotcha. Okay. <laughs> Sorry. So we got, we got off track. So back to, you talked a little bit about, you know, you like to start on the fringes. You don't want to get too intrusive. Now, what about actually setting the cameras up? Uh, you know, how high do you put them? What kind of an angle, particular direction? And then is there, you know, specific camera brands or models that you really stick to, or you use a little bit of everything? The, uh, as far as the setup, I always carry a, uh, like a camera stand. I don't rely on finding the tree in the right place or a fence post or whatever, you know, that, that I'm going to be able to attach the camera to. So I carry these stands with me and uh, there's a lot of different ones on the market. I think the stick and pick was one that I've, I've got a few of, and there's been a few others where you just stick them down in the ground, put the camera on them and away you go. Uh, that's a lot more uh, flexible than trying to rely on. And you can do it with a T post. You can do it with a lot of different, you know, something that you can buy fairly inexpensively at the farm and, and, and you know, farm supply store. So uh, uh, that's kind of the the method of, of positioning the camera, pointing it. Generally, you try to point it toward the north. I don't know that it makes a huge difference. Everybody talks about shadows moving in front of the cameras and stuff like that, triggering them. But I think a lot of the cameras have gotten pretty good about not taking a whole bunch of dead photos anymore. Um, so I've never been super worried about what direction I pointed the camera. Um, more worried about maybe getting the camera in the fringe of the weeds or something like that, you know, near a, an, a tree, but not on the tree, something where the camera doesn't become the focal point of the deer when it's walking through there. Um, you know, and I pour that pile of corn out and they walk along and they go, oh, hey, some corn, you know, and they start eating it. And I've got, you know, 12 pictures of them. So they don't smell any human scent. It's like, wow, the farmer spilled some corn. <laughs> you know, that's that's all they think. So it works pretty good. Um, and as far as like specific brands, I've used a lot of different cameras over the years, you know, and, and some of them have been a lot more reliable than others. Uh, but there's two features that I like, and, and you can kind of work through the, the claims of the various cameras. I mean, most recently I've been using some cuttybacks and they've been really good. Um, and, and there's others out there. I'm sure I'll try some others in the future, but the, uh, you want one, at least a few. 
that have a fast trigger speed. And those are going to be typically a little bit more expensive. My camera's moving here. There we go. Um, those are going to be a little bit more expensive, but those are really good for putting on trails because you don't want a, a cheap, slow trigger speed camera if the deer is going to be passing through because you might just get the tail of the deer every time, you know, rather than the head. Um, so I would spend a little bit more money there. If you're, if you're running cameras only on a bait pile, then you can go with some of the cheaper cameras because the deer is going to be there longer, you know, long enough for even a slow trigger to pick them up. Um, the other one I like is some of them have what's called a field scan or a time lapse mode. And, you know, once I've found, well, put it this way, some years I have slipped into what I'll call the advanced method. And this is where I go beyond just finding the buck that I want to hunt. You know, if it's something really special or the situation is kind of ticklish, you know, then I'll start doing more work, you know, without any bait around, really trying to narrow down or stay on top of the day-to-day -day activity of those deer. It's, it's really rare for me to do that. You know, maybe two or three times in my whole life I've actually done it. But that field scan mode is really nice for that because then it takes a picture of, of that whole corner of the field or that whole food plot, you know, every 30 seconds or whatever you set it to. And that way, the deer can come out in different places. It doesn't trigger the camera, but you still got a picture of him out there in that area. So, you know, I'll use that to really zero in day to day on a buck. But again, that kind of steps into what I'd call the advanced uh, trail camera patterning. But I do like having that feature available in case that right situation comes up where you want to, you know, jump onto that next level. Yeah, uh, I, don't, I don't like. Go ahead. I'm sorry. Well, the other thing that comes in when you start getting into that advanced level, and again, you touched on this in your column, which I found interesting because the cellular cameras, which are very, very popular now, is really a great tool on a lot of levels. And you actually mentioned you, you don't own one. You've never used one, which I find somewhat surprising not that I mean, it sounded like from what you said in your column, you almost have some some personal reasons why you don't use them. But I, I just can't believe being in the industry that you haven't had a few just to even play around with. Yeah, um, maybe people haven't been that worried about me promoting their cellular cameras. I don't know, because nobody has said, here, Bill, we'll send you one. And, and I'm not going to buy one uh, just because I, I don't want to know that much. And, and again, you know. Everybody has their own idea of, of what represents the the best experience for them of, of hunting. And to me, I like to have a little mystery left in it. You know, I like there to be a little bit of a hunt left in it, you know, maybe more than what some people are, are, are willing to, well, put it this way, what some people want. Some people want to know exactly where that deer is all the time. You know, they want to know where he was this morning. I don't want to know that because somehow that takes away a little bit of the excitement for me of hunting that deer. I want to be surprised. I want the adrenaline rush when he slows up, shows up. I don't want to expect to see him. I want to hope to see him. You know, it's kind of a, I don't know, maybe it just goes back to being old school. You know, when I started hunting, you know, every deer that showed up was an adrenaline rush. And that's kind of why I like to bow hunt. After a while, if you kill enough of these things, killing them isn't nearly as, as exciting as that moment when the deer steps out and you go, oh my gosh, there he is, you know? Um, so sometimes you got to pay the price in order for that moment to mean something. You know, if that moment becomes too cheap, then it kind of cheapens the sport in my mind. Uh, does that make any sense? Yeah, it does. I mean, and, and I think that, uh, you know, you really hit the nail on the head. It boils down to two things, really. I mean, one your personal preference and two, you know, what's legal, you know, where, yeah. where you happen to be hunting. Um, I can say, you know, t two of the biggest bucks half, right? I've killed four probably really big whitetails and two of them, I would say, are directly or very closely related to cellular trail cam use. And interestingly, neither of the two uh, cameras that I ran personally, but I saw the impact because in, in the first instance, it was a, a Kansas buck. 
I went out to hunt with a friend who had a le- has a lease out there. And the the very first morning of the hunt, when we were at, got together for breakfast, he showed me a picture of a buck that was captured working a scrape line uh, at like two or three in the morning. Uh, and I killed that buck in that same spot at three o'clock that afternoon. So literally killed that deer 12 hours later uh, because to your point, Bill, we knew where that deer was like that day, that, you know, re- very, very recently. And then um, the other one was a really big buck that I killed two falls ago there in Iowa where you live, Bill. And I was hunting over uh, in, in the Stockport area with Big Buck Down Outfitters and Big Buck Down um, boy, great outfit. I mean, I would give them extremely high recommendation, but they run literally now they have a lot of ground lease, but several hundred cellular cameras across, you know, probably a hundred different properties that they have leased. But, you know, if, if you're an outfitter and you have, you know, it's two brothers and then they have a couple of guides. So if you're like four people, Right. Four people can't possibly get to 100 properties and check 200 cameras on a daily or even weekly basis. But if you have those cellular cameras out in the field, well, now it gives you the ability to monitor all those properties and move your hunters into areas where you're getting the best buck activity. So, you know, does that cheapen it? I mean, from the perspective of somebody who's coming from out of state. And maybe only has five days to hunt. I don't want to waste four of my five days figuring out where there's a good deer. Um, But but I understand the way that you feel. And somebody else might say, well, you never would have killed those deer without the cell cams. And I would have to say you may well be right. You know, certainly my odds would have been lower. See, I think it's I mean, put it this way. If I'm an outfitter, I'm going to have them. Um, I think it's almost unethical not to use them if they're legal, if you're an outfitter. Well, if you're taking my money, right? Yeah, right. <laughs> you know, so as an outfitter, you've got to do everything you can to, to try to make you successful because you're not there necessarily just for the experience. You could have the experience sitting on public land in that same state. You know, you're there because you want the highest possible odds of killing a certain type of deer. You know, so in order to do that, then... I think the outfitter has to use every legal method available to them to help you accomplish that goal. Um, and and I, I, I totally agree with that. So I don't think it cheapens it in any way. I think it's a guy like me you know, who's hunting his backyard, so to speak. Um, I've got not unlimited time, but I can make time for whatever I need to. Um, that's where I get to be a little bit more um, pick and choose maybe of the methods that, that I use. Uh, but no, I don't. I don't see any issue whatsoever with outfitters or, or anything like that because, uh, and even there's somebody who, who uh, doesn't have a lot of time and I don't even have to pick a bone with anybody doing it. It's legal. You know, if it's legal, I'm in favor of it. It's just for me, uh, I, I like that the hunt and I like to be surprised. And if I go a whole season without killing anything, hopefully the world doesn't say, oh, Bill Winky can't kill deer. You know, it, it might just be that, you know, it just didn't line up for me. Um, but the, uh, I think the, Well, anyway, maybe we've talked circles around this thing. Well, actually, there is one more thing I want to talk about regarding cellular cameras. And I think it would be attractive even to you, Bill, because we touched on how much you, you know, you loathe to leave human scent in an area where you have a camera. And you've gone to some pretty extreme measures over the years to not alert the deer. I mean, heck, we didn't even touch on it, but gosh, the same feature art in the same September issue, you have a feature article about sleeping up on a ridge so you don't have to walk back and forth. And that's the kind of stuff you're willing to do to avoid educating deer. Well, you could use cellular camera technology and still limit yourself to your comfort level because, you know, you don't have to have those cameras transmit immediately. You could set your camera to transmit once a day or once every other day or once a week. And yet you could still take advantage of the fact that you don't have to go in there to get that SD card or whatever. So I think even for people that that don't necessarily want to go to that super advanced level, that there are things about the cellular cameras that still help you to keep your hunting area cleaner, uh, maybe keep the deer in the dark, so to speak, a little bit longer than you might with a conventional camera. 
Yeah. And that, that makes sense. In my situation, it wouldn't work because I'm still pouring that bag of corn out or whatever, you know, so I've got to go. And I don't like, and we could really get into all the philosophy of, of how to put cameras over bait and how much bait to use and why I use a limited amount, et cetera. But I just only use a small amount, you know, and I don't have a big pile of corn there. Uh, and there's a number of reasons for that. We might be getting too far off on a tangent. But so for me, I would still be going in and out of there. And, and, and I enjoy that challenge of trying to get in and out of there without the deer knowing. So it's that's still part of the hunt for me. But you're, you're totally right. You know, if, if I wasn't if I wasn't working with that you know bag of corn, then I think I probably would be more likely to use something to transmit it out. Yep. So, Mark, I'm going to let you uh, bring us home here. I mean, I think we're coming up on our last, say, five minutes or so. I'm sure you've had some thoughts as Bill and I have been talking again, uh, you know, getting, uh, you know, your good questions and then we'll wrap it up. You know, I wanted to just uh, tag on to one thing that uh, you said, Christian, about the, the, you know, the wireless cellular cameras. And, you know, nowadays you're coming out with some pretty good uh, solar wireless cameras where they, you know, you, you talk about in, in the old days, you know, you could go through batteries pretty quickly. But uh, I think with some of these new solar cameras, you could really uh, limit your footprint. Uh, you have a great backup plan. Uh, you have the battery that run off the batteries and then also the solar camera. So, I, you know, I know a, a, a couple of guys that hunt in New Jersey. I live in eastern Pennsylvania, about a half hour from the New Jersey line. And they'll use the, their their trail cameras, their wireless cameras to to try and get some tabs on some good bucks over there. So it's, they're, they're a great tool, especially like for guys that hunt out of state. And if they live on a border and things like that, but, uh, uh, you know, I think, uh, the big thing, the big takeaway is, is when you're talking about using your trail cameras is, um, you can custom tailor to what you're comfortable. Bill, you touched on it many times on not only for your situation, in the state, but for how much you like to use them. Um, you know, and, and, and undoubtedly there's guys that run them all year round. Cause they just like to see the deer or they want to start picking up the, the fawns when they're born in the spring and things like that, but to an incredible, um, scouting tool and uh, especially if you have properties where you know the right it's not the farm right next door you don't have your own land um you know if you're using a, a wireless camera especially you, you know it takes you an hour to get to your hunting property that can really mm -hmm. cut down on the learning curve and cut down on your uh time you have to put in the field and having an impact on the deer um just just a great tool mm -hmm. and they're coming out with new cameras every single year trying to improve the quality of them um like i said having you know a variety of different solar options now so uh it's a great tool and it's up to you how much you're going to use it well the five dollar gas makes the cellular cameras a lot more attractive <laughs> too yeah you can pay for a lot of batteries <clears throat> excuse me you can pay for a lot of batteries with that gas yeah, and, and the data plans don't seem as expensive either, especially like Mark said, if, if you live an hour away from your hunting property, you know, and you're filling your truck, you know, every time you got to go there, just just get two cellular cameras and be done with it, you know? Right. Yeah, absolutely. Well, Bill, I hope you get a chance to go to the beach sometime this summer. I mean, it's I'm funny. I'm Mark, Mark, I was going to say... Person. You know, it's funny because, you know, again, we're in Pennsylvania, which, you know, of course, and it's not that far. It's only a couple hours, you know, to the shore in the middle of the country where you live like here. It's typical for families to always go like on a beach trip in the summertime. If you grow up in Iowa or Kansas or Missouri, like that's not a thing so much, is it? Well, I mean, there's a few lakes around, of course, and the Mississippi River has got a lot of sandbars. I mean, there's places you can find sand. Um, it's not the same as the ocean beach, but you know, you can find the same type of experience if you want it bad enough. Yeah. But it's more of like, go to the lake in that part of the world. Yeah, right. That's yeah. right. Yeah. Well, listen, man, uh, I really appreciate it. I think, uh, I think we, you offered a lot of good, good advice in there and, uh, something tells me, uh, you know, partly because I'm confident in Bill Winky and partly because I'm my faith in Iowa it never wavers. You're gonna you're gonna find a, a pretty good buck to hunt again this year. Oh well, we'll we'll see. I've I've gotten to that point in my career where I'm not as driven on that as what I used to be. You know, I mean, you still have to maintain credibility with the viewers and the and the readers and stuff like that. You know, and, and you know, so you always want to say, well, I'm gonna try to hunt this big deer or that big deer. But um, to me, it's the age class of the deer. It's the just the being in the cool places, you know, and, and, uh, 
Uh, I don't even like hunting when it's freezing cold anymore. You know, I hate sounding like a big baby, but it's, to me, it, it's starting to transition more into the the overall experience rather than just putting another big one on the wall. Uh, so we'll see. Uh, my my drive. I- I don't believe that. You. This is this no. is coming. This is the guy who was sleeping up on the ridge was, in a really bivy cool. sack last fall, trying to convince me that he doesn't have the drive to kill big deer anymore. But but that was cool though. It was it's more of the experience, you know. It's like he could have been a 140 inch, you know, five year old buck that I really wanted to kill. He didn't have to be a giant antler deer, you know. It's more, it's just the challenge of the chase, and. uh I'm not saying I wouldn't go after the biggest one in the area, but I'm not nearly as worried about the antler size as maybe I was 15 or 20 years ago. Now it's more just the, the thrill of the chase. And, but you got to, in my mind, you got to have a target. You know, in order to make it a chase, you got to pick one. And uh, trail cameras help you do that, it makes the sport, you know, personal. You know, that now it's me against this buck or whatever, you know. And, and uh, if I got to sleep on the ridge to get him, hey, then that's what I got to do, you know. But it doesn't necessarily mean he's a 200 inch deer. Um, it's, it's, I don't know. It's a transition, I guess. I'm getting old, Christian. I guess that's what it boils down to. Well, none of us are getting any younger. And, uh, (laughs) I'll tell you what I'm going to do, Bill, is I know you won't be getting yours out. I'm going to get my cameras out there here, probably like maybe even on the fourth. That's a good day since there's, it's obviously a holiday off and I got a little picnic to go to later in the afternoon, but I can probably get the side-by-side loaded up uh, Monday morning and, and go visit a couple farms where I hunt and put up some minerals and some cameras. And I'll start sending you some pictures of beautiful bucks in velvet that I won't see or kill come the fall. And you'll tell me, hey, you're just wasting my time, your, your time. But I, I call it red redneck entertainment. You know, oh, it's, no, pretty, I think it's pretty cheap. I think it's awesome. No, good for you. Uh, I hope you have I hope you have a lot of fun doing it, and I'm sure you will. Yep, and uh, and then I'll just wait for you. You'll you'll just be like, yeah, I'm just going to wait till September, and then I'm going to go kill this 170, you know, like October 10th or something like that. No, it won't be that, that easy. That, yeah. <laughs> well, that's another episode. We got to have you back, like uh, in September, to do the uh, the October is the new November episode. Yeah, and and you know just to to do a little cheat sheet on that one. We've had a lot of success in October lately. Um, and, and I do think that it's not the new November, but I do feel like we're getting better at hunting October and, and knowing what to look for there. So uh, I love October. Uh, I think if, if I had to pick between October and November, gosh, I'm not sure. <clears throat> I suppose I'd still pick November, but I really like October. But late October is probably the most beautiful time in the woods yeah. when the yeah. when the foliage is peak. It's not quite as cold, uh, right. but it all boils down to, like you said, Bill, can you, you know, can you get the right buck to move at the right time in the right place? But uh, anyway, well, you get, that's, you get, well, well, let's, let's cheat there. If you get a cold front the last week of October, it's money. That's that's my go. that's my my cheat. On, that's on that's episode. Bill. That's actually probably Bill Winky's number one like green light tip for deer hunting yeah yeah no, so don't we, yeah absolutely well thanks guys it, it was good um appreciate appreciate both of your time and uh, uh i don't know what else to say mark mark you bring us out you always have something nice to say at the end well we're just gonna say uh, this time have a great fourth uh, it was great to see you guys and everybody start thinking about your trail cam plan for this year Thanks for downloading the Peterson's Bow Hunting Podcast. All bow hunting, all the time. Pick up the latest issue of Peterson's Bow Hunting Magazine on your local newsstand or connect with us online at bowhuntingmag.com. <laughs>